is what um, the uh, able body, you know, what able body people are dying from. Um, there are still some issues that we need to take a look at. So again, uh, when I talked about infections where people would get septicemia and would die, th that is still occurring. So it's really important that people pay attention to their uni urinary health, because again, it, is, uh, it has creeped up in terms of causing premature death uh, in people with SCI. Psychosocial issues, again, that's really my bag and what I'm really interested in. Uh, is, is a big concern. Uh, there are still high rates of depression and suicide, particularly for younger adults um, who are less than 25 years. Uh, and it's still an ongoing uh, issue. And that's why it's really important that we find resources, uh, early post-injury to help people cope uh, with you know, the life-changing uh, issues that come with spinal cord injury. But really with aging, it's survival is, is one part of the puzzle. We really want to make sure that if we're aging, that we're aging well, that we're able to, again, feel fairly good in terms of our physical health, that we're able to go out, that we're able to socialize. So aging really became an important topic. Uh, and I would say it was really um, around the late 1980s that people started to think more about what it's like to age long term with spinal cord injury. But, you know, studying aging in any population, you know, be it able-bodied, people with SCI or other groups, is extremely complex because it's not just biological. It's There's a psychological component to aging. There's a social uh, process uh, associated with it. Uh, so it's, it's really complicated to uh, figure out. And then when we superimpose a spinal cord injury, on, in, a spinal cord injury onto that process, uh, you know, it further complicates our understanding uh, because we're not only really sure what age, what changes occur because of the injury, what occurs because of the typical aging process, or what arises as a combination of both interacting with one another. So one issue that makes understanding aging with uh, a spinal cord injury important is that there's evidence that is that uh, that people with SCI may be prematurely aging. So this is sort of a, a red flag that's come up from some of the literature saying we really need to understand what's going on again, to optimize people's health and well-being long-term. So uh, aging is, again, it, it generally follows a uniform pattern, but it's not exactly um, uh, uniform within individuals. There is variability. So, you know, not only depends, uh, you know, on biological processes, it depends on the genes you've inherited, uh, the type of lifestyle, your environmental factors. I mean, imagine what Keith Richards might look like today if he hadn't uh, partied so hard <laughs> in, his, uh, in his heyday. Uh, but generally, aging does uh, proceed in an orderly and predictable fashion. Now, at the biological level, the aging process is thought to begin after we reach physical maturity, and that's typically around 20 to 25 years of age. And then at that point, our system starts to decline. So what I've tried to do, and others, uh, notably, notably this um, uh, researcher uh, Atkins from the UK, is to use a reserve capacity model to try and explain typical aging uh, and uh, apply this to spinal cord injury. And the reason why this model, and there's lots of different theories of aging available, uh, is, is sort of very um, uh, you know, uh, useful, is because it, it conceptualizes biological aging is that we reach a certain point and then we start to have a drop in uh, our physical capacity, which starts to decline at around 1% a year after we've reached that physical maturity. So after our system reaches a certain point, and it's you know thought to be around 40% of that reserve capacity, that's when we become more vulnerable to injury and disease. So I'm sorry, this model, this image isn't as clear as I'd hoped, but um, basically, this sort of shows the model. So as you see, as somebody's born, they start, you know, getting older, they start building muscle mass, you know, getting stronger, they reach around 20, and then they start declining. Again, 1% uh, per year, that's what it's um, thought. And then when you sort of reach this less than 50 to 40%, that's when you start running into trouble. That's when, you know, uh, diseases associated with aging start to come around wear and tear comes into play. So this is sort of where a bit of the danger zone is uh, in the aging process. 
Now, when somebody has a spinal cord injury, that disrupts the whole system. Uh, it disrupts, you know, uh, your nervous system, other changes happen. And because of this disruption, it may potentially cause some of the reserve capacity to drop, which in turn may accelerate the rate of physical decline. So that's what happens initially. And then once, you know, you've sort of stabilized, you've gone, you know, you've gone through your surgeries, you've gone through rehab and your system starts to uh, reset somewhat uh, or get a, a little bit more balanced uh, after that initial shock of going the SCI, then the aging process is thought to proceed at a normal rate. So this is the model, uh, that reserve capacity model where we put uh, somebody with a spinal cord injury. So again, people start to age, develop. Here you have a, this is where the spinal cord uh, injury occurs people drop in reserve capacity, and then they start again aging at uh, a steady decline. So this is the theory that's put out in terms of, uh, of aging with an SCI. Now, because of this disruption, people may have less capacity and may become more vulnerable uh, to further injury and disease earlier than typically expected. Because again, if you're able-bodied, you're starting up here, and then all of a sudden you've had your SCI, you've already dropped a little bit. So that's the, again, the theory of the model. Now, what further complicates this is the age of onset uh, because older adults, so if you've sustained your spinal cord injury when you're in your 60s, um, you may not undergo the same type of changes after injury that a younger person does. And some people have actually proposed that the older someone is when you're injured, could possibly have less of an impact on some of the body systems because your peak capacity has already been reached. And really where the support or evidence for this argument comes from is looking at uh, bone changes uh, after spinal cord injury. So for instance, um, uh, the rate of bone mass, bone loss that typically occurs after that first year of the injury uh, may be greater in younger adults than in older adults, because the older adults have already lost some of that bone mass that comes with age-associated aging. So there's only so much you can lose at a certain age, whereas if you're a younger person, you have a lot of bone mass, and then they might show us a more dramatic drop in, 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 uh, in, in changes in their bone uh, mineral density. So that's one of the issues. But on the other hand, if you're older, you may have more comorbidities. You may have a pre- uh, you know, uh, morbid condition like heart disease, uh, you might have high blood pressure, uh, all of these other things that could lead to poor health outcomes. So it's really complicated. And, you know, so we're really trying to figure out what we can do uh, to answer that question. That's really what brought me to the research that, uh, that I'm going to be talking about now, because I was really interested to understand, uh, you know, does premature aging occur for people with SCI? Um, I wanted to know, does it happen across all the biological systems or only some of them? And then I really wanted to understand if these changes uh, were related to chronological age or to years post-injury. So this was the real um, main focus of uh, this first part of the talk that I'm going over. Uh, before I continue, is this, this pace okay? Any questions about what I've covered? Anybody, everyone's good so far? I'm good. seeing nods. Yeah. Okay, great. And again, if there's any questions or, or things, and I got, I got a virtual thumbs up, so I always like those, so thank you. So how did I do this? So what I did was a systematic review where I looked at all the literature that I could find that's already been published. Um, and what we did was we looked at non-intervention studies. So we wanted to try and look at people uh, studies that looked at people in more natural conditions, but people weren't being administered drugs or undergoing an intervention to see if there's a change. I wanted to try and get a good understanding uh, of the aging process. And so uh, ideally we wanted studies that were longitudinal. So these are studies that look at people over time because that's really the best way to understand how people are aging. And then in cases where there wasn't longitudinal studies, I took studies that had a wide age range of people with injuries that were matched with an able group uh, body comparison group. So people who were matched on chronological age. And the reason why these types of studies help provide some insight on answering the questions about aging 
is because then we can compare people across age groups. So for example, if a 20 year old with an injury has comparable bone mass to somebody, uh, to an able-bodied 60 year old, then we could say you know, with some confidence that this change is a sign of premature aging. So it was really trying to get these studies that could answer these questions in a way uh, that would make sense. And um, in terms of the uh, this Downs and Black tool, which is, which is not really critical for this talk, but obviously no research is perfect. Uh, every time I submit a paper, it comes back with a thousand comments saying, why did you do this? You did this wrong, uh, you know, fix that. Uh, but it's really important we know what things were sort of controlled for, whether the study reported all the things that they should be reporting so that it could be replicated. So this really talked about how good the quality of the evidence is. So, and I'll talk about that at a, at a higher level. So let's start. So in terms of the cardiovascular and endocrine system, so the systems that control the hormones uh, in your body, uh, I found 24 studies that uh, met the inclusion criteria uh, for the review. And really from, from these 24 studies, there's a lot suggesting that there's uh, premature aging going on with these two systems. Uh, and this is mostly because of a number of the physiological changes that happen after a spinal cord injury. So uh, people with spinal cord injury, uh, in terms of their, uh, when you go for those blood tests, they have abnormal lipid profiles, uh, they have impaired glucose tolerance, so their ability to, uh, you know, uh, manage the sugar into their bodies is, 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 um, is damaged. Uh, for men, uh, the testosterone secretion is impaired. Uh, there's all these things that happen. There's greater plaque that's built up on the heart from some of the studies that we found. And there's higher levels of fat tissue and less uh, lean tissue muscle uh, in a person which indicates uh, all risk factors for developing cardiovascular disease. And for people with, um, because of some of the neurological impairments, especially for people with a complete injury where there is a limited sensation or a motor function below that level of spinal cord injury, uh, there have been abnormal heart uh, findings and increased blood pressure when exercising. And that's again, not surprising because your autonomic system is not working the way that it should if, it, if you hadn't that spinal cord injury. And so uh, again, if, you're, if you have a complete injury, you're doing a lot of intense exercise, your heart might be working uh, a lot harder in different ways, which raises your risk for um, uh, you know, uh, cardiovascular disease or developing diabetes. And with that, uh, there is some study, and this was a study done with veterans in the US, uh, finding that veterans with a spinal cord injury had higher levels of diabetes and an earlier age of onset. So they were getting it younger than their match controls. Uh, again, veterans uh, have a, a bit of a unique profile and uh, you know, not always comparable to the general population for a variety of reasons, but still uh, it was a little bit shocking to see uh, the rates of diabetes in that, in that paper. Um, and again, the reason why this happens is because it's harder for some people with spinal cord injury to exercise as frequently or as, in, as intensely as, again, uh, people without an injury. So this puts you at higher risk for diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And again, several studies have found that people were at higher risk uh, for, for uh, cardiovascular disease. So in terms of the musculoskeletal system, so you know your skeleton, your, your spine, all that, there's, again, lots of evidence from several longitudinal and comparison studies showing premature aging, but most of this seems to happen, again, uh, at the lower extremity. So in your uh, legs uh, is, is where the hips and knees is where we're seeing a lot of this, these changes. So when looking at factors like age or years post-injury, uh, people who are older may have a slower rate of decline compared to younger adults. And again, several studies have shown this, uh, again, and it goes back to that reserve uh, model of aging that I talked about, because older adults already have decreased bone mass as a result of aging. Uh, we know a lot of women without a spinal cord injury are at high risk for osteoporosis uh, and, uh, you know, experience uh, fractures quite easily because of what happens uh, uh, as they age. But, um, uh, you know, some of the studies examining bone loss over time show that years post-injury is, is, is associated more with bone loss than age. And again, uh, 
there are high rates of uh, people with spinal cord injury experiencing a fragility fracture. So, and you know, if if somebody uh, transfers improperly or, or falls, uh, again, in an able-bodied person, nothing may happen, but because your bone mass has, has shrunk so much, you are at higher risk for developing a fracture. So, it's really in terms of those uh, risk factors for fractures, it's the years post injury. Now, what was weird uh, is there's a lot of studies showing that you know the lumbar spine actually is is stronger in people with spinal cord injury than the able-bodied population, um, and it and actually may gain bone mass over time. This happens because for those people who are sitting in a wheelchair for most of the day, you're putting a lot more weight on your lower spine than than uh, other people would. But it was just interesting to see that this was actually happening over time um, and a bit of a surprising finding. Uh, shoulder pain, uh, as, as many of you may know, is a frequent problem for people with injuries. Um, and there's just a lot of evidence showing that it's really associated with years post-injury because a lot of you may be relying on your uh, arms for most of, uh, you know, wheeling your wheelchairs, doing your transfers. So there's a lot of wear and tear that comes with, uh, with a spinal cord injury uh, in your shoulders. Uh, but there is a little bit of evidence that uh, chronological age may also play a role because older people are, were more likely to report shoulder pain. Um, again, there are some changes in muscle mass that occur. And so you also might, you know, with that decrease in muscle mass that happens because of chronological age mixed with all the things that you're doing uh, with your wheelchair and transfers, may uh, exacerbate that problem for some people. Again, a weird finding is that uh, if any of you ever wanna go into uh, thumb war competition, you may win uh, because people, it's shown that uh, people who use their wheelchairs actually have stronger hand grip strength. So, you know, you all probably have firmer handshakes than, than the average person. So uh, again, a, a small thing, but uh, you know, at least it isn't all necessarily in a negative way. So that was one of those uh, interesting findings uh, I found in the literature. So in terms of the genitourinary, I'm gonna mispronounce this because I'm a fake doctor, uh, genitourinary system, so your bowel and bladder, um, there is some limited evidence uh, but it, that it, there's some premature aging, but it's really not conclusive. Um, it's thought that some people who develop neurogenic bladder uh, because of their injury may be at risk for increased health problems over time, like urinary tract infections, but it really depended on the type of bladder management techniques. So this is one study that looked at it, and what they found was those people who were using indwelling catheters, uh, that may contribute to the higher rates of uh, bladder infections. Um, and then there was uh, a study looking at, at changes over time uh, which found that there was some renal decline over a 10-year period following injury. But again, one of the studies said it might be the age of onset that sort of mediates that. So again, if you got it younger and you look over time, there's more decline. But if you're older, that decline may not uh, occur at the same rate. Uh, and again, uh, the finding was that people who were 50 or, uh, or younger um, or who were younger than 20 had comparable renal function to uh, an able-bodied match control, whereas those people between 21 and 50 were showing impaired functioning. So, you know, again, a lot of mixed findings around that. Uh, interest, interestingly, uh, men were at lower risk for prostate cancer. Um, low, at lower risk for prostate cancer with a spinal cord injury. Hmm. Quite interesting. Yeah, so uh, they found it was a lower risk, but when it was detected, it was more advanced and uh, non-localized. So when it was found in males, uh, it, was, uh, it was far worse. Again, it may be because people with spinal cord injury, at least in this sample, weren't going for regular screening. So gentlemen, sorry, uh, you should be visiting your doctor and, and getting that prostate exam regularly. No escaping it. Um, in terms of the gastrointestinal system, um, there's been less work. Um, again, there is some evidence that people with neurogenic bowel may be at an increased risk for premature aging uh, because the rates of bowel-related problems tend to be higher in people with injuries than those without. And this was across all age groups. So if you're an older adult with a neurogenic bowel, you're going to have more problems. This intuitively makes sense because a spinal cord injury for some people leads to impaired bowel functioning. 
Uh, but you know, a lot of the problems tended to stay very stable over time. So if you had these issues when you're younger and then you went back, it was probably still the same frequency and types of problems. And that might be a, a factor associated that people have well-established bowel routines. Whereas in the older, whereas in the able-bodied population, bowel problems increased over time. Um, and again, a lot of these studies, it really, you have to take into account the people's level of injury and severity, which really gives some nuance to some of these findings. Respiratory system, there, there hardly was any work done on this. And this was a little bit surprising given that, you know, pneumonia and respiratory problems are still a leading cause uh, of death in the spinal cord injury population at any age. Um, and I found one study that looked at uh, sleep apnea. So if, you know, uh, the study, I think it was done in Sweden, they did a mail out and looked at, you know, how many people were snoring. And uh, essentially they found people with SDI had higher rates of sleep apnea than the, um, the match control. But this may not necessarily be because of changes to the respiratory system. In some cases, if you have a higher level of injury, you do have impaired respiratory function, but it's actually might be more likely due to changes in body composition. Again, uh, if you don't have full control over your, uh, your, your body and you know there are changes that happen depending on your level of injury, that may also contribute to sleep apnea. Hardly anything done on the nervous system. Um, the only thing I could really find at the time was uh, a study uh, looking at pain uh, over time. And this wasn't even, there's nothing uh, comparable to the able-bodied population, which, which you know, uh, wouldn't really come up if you, if you think about it. But, uh, you know, pain is such a, an ongoing issue and we really don't have a great understanding, especially for those people with that neurogenic, that, you know, burning nerve pain that uh, it really affects people's uh, quality of life and, and a whole host of things. Um, but essentially, some studies are saying that if you have it early on in your injury, you're likely to have it uh, over time. Uh, but hopefully, you know, uh, there have been advances in pain research, uh, better medications, better understanding. When I first started at the Linter Center, there was a lot of people who didn't believe people with spinal cord injury had pain. How can you have pain? You don't have any uh, feeling or uh, you know motor function below your level of injury. So uh, you know I, I'm glad to say there's been a big change and a lot of uh, effort into addressing it, and hopefully it's led to some improvements for some people uh, you know with this issue. So in terms of the the big picture, um, really the best evidence for this premature aging uh, hypothesis that I had was for the musculoskeletal system. There was a number of studies that provided some strong evidence for this. So this, the quality of the studies were really the best for that. There was a lot of studies for cardiovascular and endocrine systems as well, but the studies weren't as good or well-designed as uh, some of the MSK studies. Some of the musculoskeletal studies, they actually had identical twins where they were doing comparisons. And that's really the best type of design. It's rare to have somebody with a spinal cord injury having a twin that's able-bodied. So, um, and I actually know somebody with a twin uh, who did a lot of these studies, uh, which really revealed in terms of what, you know, if that person hadn't had a spinal cord injury, what their, their health would have looked like uh, by looking at it in their twin. Skin and respiratory, again, very limited. Evidence was not great. And you can see that was basically the case for the rest of the body uh, systems that we looked at. So it, it was really mixed. So at that time, you know, my key recommendation from that work is like, we, we need to do better. We really need more research to look at all the systems to see if spinal cord injury is a true model of premature aging. Uh, and this is really should be 30 years ago because this was a question that uh, somebody asked in the late 1980s, uh, which was a book that I read, you know, uh, with religious fervor as, as a young PhD student saying, we really need to do a better job. And then I concluded the same thing. So again, there's a need for more longitudinal research looking at how people are aging over time. The Praxis Institute has the Rick Hansen Registry, which will maybe start answering some of those questions. But in the meantime, if you're gonna do a study, uh, try and get a good age match comparison so that we can look at 
what's uh, happening uh, and, and start pulling out more of those insights around the aging process. Um, and again, you know, a lot of times people say, I'm gonna include age in my study because I need to describe my research sample. It's so much more than that. We really need, it's, it's, it's something that's ongoing and it needs to be factored in as more of an explanatory model for why certain people may be experiencing health issues and what's going on in the long term. So that's really that literature search. I'm gonna just stop there and do a quick check-in if any questions about that. And yes, I'm a Star Wars fan. <laughs> Jeff had a question. So Jeff, if you wanna take yourself off mute, feel free. Okay, um, my question is um, in March, I had um, a super pubic put in and I'm getting a lot of bladder infections. Is there any research or is it a bad idea to go into a silver touch catheter? Yeah. So Sorry, go ahead. Like just to reduce the infections? Well, I mean, that's something that I'm going to, again, preface that I'm a fake doctor and, you know, any advice I give, I'm going to say, you know, you should be going back to your, you know, family physician or uh, your physiatrist to see what's going on. But if you're having frequent, you know, urinary tract infections, it may not be the right fit for you. Um, again, I know there's a lot of issues uh, with the with the spinal cord injury community and access to affordable uh, equipment for bladder management. Uh, so my short answer is I, I don't know about the that specific catheter, but I would say that if you're having recurring issues, then it's you know, and again, if if you, if you've had your spinal cord injury for a while, you know you don't want to be consistently having UTIs. I don't know if that helps at all. I see. Is Tom, are you raising your hand? Tom. Yes, please. Yeah, can ahead. you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I'm pleased to note that you've found so much research, but I also share your concern about most of it being very old research. And I'm over 60 years post-injury, and I just had my 81st birthday. And I've been fortunate to live in Vancouver area so I can continue with um, contact with the GF Strong physiatrists who have a ton of people with varying age um, experience and pre-injury age. And I wondered if there's a, a research study being proposed now that could include all of these kinds of factors. So one thing, well, first of all, happy birthday. Uh, <laughs> and second, uh, you know, one thing that's amazing about the spinal cord injured community is that it's really well connected. So, uh, you know, people who are living in the community are working with researchers, researchers are working with clinicians, and there's been so much money that has been poured into resources to help people promote better health for research, again, from the Praxis Institute, uh, from other agencies across Canada, that given that there's really about only a thousand new cases of spinal cord injury per year, and compared to, let's say, larger patient groups like um, stroke or other uh, disability populations, there is a ton of resources and being directed. So I think it's something that's recognized. Um, uh, and in terms of making access to care, there's a lot of work being done around, again, tele-rehab to try and make it more accessible. There's work around mobile clinics. Uh, at least I know of a few here in Ontario. I don't know what's happening in BC. But I think what's important is that you continue to, you know, raise your voice and say, hey, these are my concerns. And, you know, we want to work with you to get answers to these problems. Um, again, research, I was talking to Terry before I came on, is sometimes a bit of a slow process, but there are ways to accelerate it, again, by, again, working with great organizations like Spinal Cord Injury BC to make sure that your concerns are being addressed. And if they're not, then, uh, you know, people like myself aren't doing our jobs because ultimately what I want for my research to do is to get into the hands of people who can use it either to advocate for more resources 
or to come up with better solutions uh, for care. Um, so again, uh, that would be my, my, my quick answer to a very complicated question. Thank you. And I guess the only uh, saving grace is that British Columbia has relatively few large cities. In one way, that's an advantage, in another, it's not. Mm -hmm. But if we're close to one of those cities, which has uh, a good um, rehab contact, or even if it's only uh, a GP who's got some experience dealing with a number of SCIs, that's that's critical. Yeah. Um, and again, the uh, the urinary tract um, specialists are learning as well. And uh, I think we're quite lucky in BC, but we need to even improve that because even Kelowna has a pretty good uh, population within a couple hundred miles of there, a hundred miles of there easily. And uh, that could be a focus of, of some of this uh, expertise. Yeah. No, it's ac yeah, access is so important. I knew of somebody who lived in Ottawa and they would come to Lyndhurst uh, to, you know, a couple hour drive once a year to get all their health needs met. Uh, so it's definitely access is so important. Um, I don't know if there's any more questions, but I can just go on and then is, is that okay if I keep yeah, going? Yeah, why don't you go, there's a few more questions okay, sure. I know, um, but do you want to just finish up and then we can save them till the end? Because there well, may be- Well, is that okay by everyone? I don't want to, uh, and I'm not happy to stay longer to answer as many questions, but I know some people may have to get off right at five. Yeah, why don't you uh, go ahead? I see a nod from Jolaine. Jolaine, I have you marked on my sheet to ask uh, the next question. Terry, you also had your hand up as well, but. And I, and I saw Tinkerbell from Preston had her hand up. Right? Yeah, that's Jolaine. <laughs> okay, Jolaine. <laughs> um, so just again, in terms of my own research, um, uh, I was really interested in aging and I was fortunate to have access to a, a research database before, this was before the Rick Hansen registry came about. Uh, at the Linter Center, we had a long-term uh, health outcomes database that tracked uh, our patients over time. And really we collected some data on demographics, impairment, and the types of secondary health conditions they had. So the first time data was collected, uh, this was done between 95 and 97. Uh, and they got data on 851 uh, people. And then when I came uh, uh, to Lindhurst, I, I looked over the second uh, round of data collection and we got data on 827 people. And between that time, we got data on 344 people. So it was really exciting to be able to see what was happening in Canada over time. And in terms of the sample, we got a, a, a fairly you know, diverse group of people in terms of their level of injury. Um, you know, on average, people were about 12 years post-injury, but some people at time one were as little as less than one year post-injury and as long as 52. And then at time two, the mean uh, time post-injury was 19 years. And then the minimal uh, um, uh, uh, duration of injury was seven years and as long as 58 years. So, you know, people aged, uh, you know, uh, about five to seven years uh, during that time. And you can see that we had data on a variety of different health conditions, and we just asked people if they had them or not. So very, you know, a small proportion of people had cardiac issues, kidney problems, and then some of the more common issues like pain, bladder problems were, were much more common. So this was the, uh, the, the frequency of conditions that uh, time one. Now at time two, what we saw was actually a big jump in a number of the conditions. So over that five to seven year period, uh, there was a significant uh, increase in the number of cardiac problems, uh, pressure injury sores, um, arthritis and joint pain uh, and things like that. But what was really interesting was that these lower level, like less frequent uh, health conditions actually were the ones that doubled in frequency over time. And these are the types of things that are associated with aging, right? So people were reporting more cardiac problems, uh, again, kidney issues, high blood pressure, um, and then other things associated like wear and tear, like arthritis and joint pain. And then there was a slight increase in pain. So what we were really seeing 
was an increase uh, in these health conditions uh, over time. So, and, and just sort of to tie it all together, you know, irrespective of age or years post-injury from that, that study I did, the odds of developing a variety of uh, secondary health conditions increased over time. And again, notably around high blood pressure and cardiac problems, ones that are typically associated with aging jumped up. And, and, and the takeaway was that there were declines in health within a five to eight year period, which if you think about it is a relatively short period of time. So again, taking that, uh, systematic review that I did along with uh, this other study, it, it sort of still builds, it, there's a little bit more evidence around that risk for premature aging. And of course, as we're getting older and having these health conditions, um, you know, it's not a great feeling that our health is always bad. Uh, you know, even myself, I'm starting to go to my family doctor more often and he's saying, oh, you should watch this, you should watch that. Uh, but after somebody sustains a spinal cord injury, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it can lead to depression uh, for some people, uh, and it has been found to be higher uh, than in the general population. Um, and that if that, you know, emotional distress isn't managed well early on, then that can continue for some quite, for, for some uh, time uh, moving forward. Um, and again, if somebody's depressed, then you're not going to eat well, you're not going to really care. If you're going to your doctor, so I, you know, again, coming from a psychosocial background, you know, your biological or physical health is important, but your mental health is as equally important for aging well in the community. And there's some really interesting studies showing that if you're doing well early on, then you're going to probably do well in the long term. And there was one study that looked at people uh, at 12 weeks post injury, and then followed up with them 10 years later. And those people who were doing well at 12 weeks were just doing as well 10 years later, whereas those people who were coping poorly early on were also co coping. So it's really important that we get the resources in place so people can age well. And again, with a spinal cord injury, there's a number of different challenges. So even if you are coping well, there's you know environmental barriers you have to navigate, there's health issues. This can impact you know, your ability to participate in the community. And this can put you at risk for becoming socially isolated. And, I think we're all familiar with that now, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but it's, it's really a complex and important issue. Uh, and even before the pandemic, it was sort of being acknowledged as a, uh, an at-risk phenomenon or a bit of a crisis, a silent crisis that was happening. Um, because you know, when you're socially isolated, it has implications for our health and well-being. And you know, it, it can be things related to loneliness and being you know, physically isolated from others. Um, and it's really characterized as a lack of a, of a sense of belonging socially, not engaging with others, having small number of social contacts and not really being able to have good and meaningful relationships. And from a research side, uh, we try and separate that because when we, we really wanna understand what social isolation is and how it's affecting people's well-being. So one way that we conceptualize it is social disconnectedness. And that's really looking at objective markers of being socially isolated. So do you live alone? Uh, you know, uh, do you have a small number of friends or family members that you can access? Do you not participate in a lot of activity? These are things that are really observable and easy to mark off. On the other hand, what is your reaction to being socially isolated? So we call this perceived social isolation. And these are the feelings of loneliness that come out because you're isolated. Now, if you hate people and you're you know, physically alone, then you may not feel lonely and it's not such an issue. Uh, but again, uh, you know, it's, it's really a complex emotion. And even if you're in a room full of people, if for whatever reason you don't feel like you belong, you still might feel lonely. So this is sort of showcases some of the nuance or distinction between being physically isolated and then your feelings to that. And in both cases, you know, being socially isolated has health risks and feelings of loneliness are associated with things like depression and sleep issues. And a number of studies have shown how these different patterns may emerge depending on if you're socially isolated or loneliness. But one thing that comes out is that both will lead to premature mortality. Because if you're socially isolated, then you, know, you have less uh, uh, chances of somebody saying, hey, uh, you know, Terry, how are you doing? Okay, uh, I should check on you. Do you need help with anything? 
Whereas if you're feeling lonely, then you might de develop depression and you're not gonna see out the help that you need. So, you know, it's a real issue. And when I started looking at this, you know, I was really surprised that there was hardly any research on social isolation and loneliness in any physical disability populations. So, you know, again, being a researcher, I said, you know, I wanna get a better understanding of what's happening. And uh, I got uh, funding and I wanted to look at, uh, at social isolation uh, in people with a disability and really to understand what are people's networks looking like and the rates of, uh, of loneliness and how it was affecting people's health and uh, well-being. Uh, and again, I'm, Terry, I'm happy to share my slides after uh, if people want to see it uh, after. So I was able to get data. I did a telephone survey with 170 people living across Ontario. Uh, again, mostly men, uh, mostly people with traumatic injuries. Got a bit of a, a spread in terms of uh, different levels of injury. And again, uh, about 100 people were married. The other were 68 were single or widowed or divorced. Uh, so again, got a, a, a bit of a, a spread and even got some people living in rural parts of Ontario. So what I found was that there were really high rates of loneliness uh, in, in the people I interviewed. Uh, about one third uh, had a score of greater than six on this loneliness measure that we use. It's one of the most widely used measures to look at loneliness in a, in a variety of different uh, uh, populations. Uh, so about one third uh, were reporting that they felt that they lacked companionship, that they felt left out or were feeling isolated from others either some of the time or, or often. So that was a bit of an eye opener that there were such high rates of loneliness. And in terms of the social network, so how well were they connected uh, and how that manifested in terms of loneliness, we looked at people's living situations, uh, number of people they felt close to, and we found that the more people that they had, people that they felt close to living in the household uh, was associated with less feelings of loneliness. And that if you had more you know, days of interacting with your social network, then you had lower feelings of loneliness. And at the same time, the closer you felt to those people, the better off you were. But what was interesting, it didn't matter how many people you had in your network. So you could have had 100 people. Uh, so if you're really popular on Facebook or, or Twitter and you have all these followers and friends, that's great. But if that relationship, that quality of the relationship's not there, it's not going to offer you any protective factors. So it's really about the quality of those relationships. And then when I looked at uh, its impact on health and quality of life, uh, what was really predictive of better physical mental health was having people in the household. So it's having that access to people who can maybe help with shopping or other important uh, activities of daily living. And again, that could, that's not necessarily a family member. It could be a, a personal support worker, anyone that uh, our sample felt was important for their health and well-being. Um, in terms of loneliness, uh, a predictor was, um, sorry, in terms of mental health, loneliness was really a strong predictor of poor mental health and life satisfaction. And again, that better uh, network intimacy was, was associated with better life satisfaction. So in terms of this study, again, we found that uh, perceived social isolation is, is an issue for the SEI community. And this was pre-pandemic with a, about a third having high rates. And there was another study in the States that found uh, a similar, about a quarter of, of a US sample uh, were having similar scores on the same measure that I tested. And I actually replicated the study in limb loss because I do a lot of work in amputation now, and we found the same pattern. So there's something going on uh, if you have mobility issues that again, creates barriers um, uh, to, to participate in the community. Um, again, having a really good social network is productive. And this is similar to older adults, which sort of ties in this premature aging. When I looked at the patterns of social networks in SEI, there's been a ton of work done in older adults showing that they tend to have smaller networks, that the quality is better because for some people who are older, you don't want to waste time on people who cause you grief. You want the people in your life who's going to make you happy. Um, and again, just all these other factors that predict uh, better um, outcomes. So just in terms of large, uh, big picture of everything I've talked about, you know, people with SEI are thankfully living longer. There is some evidence there's a risk for premature aging, biologically, socially, in terms of some of the 
social isolation. But again, we need better evidence to really conclusively say what's going on. And some of these things are modifiable. It's not, it's not a doom or gloom and you know, one size fits all uh, picture. Again, depending on your genetics, depending on things that you modify. So if you aren't smoking, you know, eating well, all those other things. I know Terry talked about uh, a program that she's starting in terms of weight management. There's all these things that you can do. Um, and there's, and again, a lot of things that are out there and I'm, I'm almost done. So I'll leave some time for questions. Um, one thing, and this is, this was developed by a, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Kathy Craven, who's a physiatrist uh, at the Linter Center. And she really talks about this 10, 100,000 kilometer tune-up on things that you should be doing to promote your health. So things like getting your regular checkup, uh, getting urology tests, really, you know, get, get your kidney and bladder ultrasound every year, uh, go for bone tests at least one to every two years, especially if you're in a wheelchair, breathing tests, go for cancer screens. So really the take home for this is go for regular health screens. In terms of the social components, stay active, stay connected as best as possible, even virtually is, is you know, important. It's great to see people. When I was working in my basement as, I'm, as I am here tonight, I was in my basement for a year and a half and it was, you know, I started going stir crazy, not seeing my colleagues at work and being able to go around. So it, it's really important to reach out and, you know, have those conversations um, and, you know, do things that will keep you connected. So this, this, this uh, resource is, is available at the Spinal Cord Injury Essentials website and you can download it. And there's all sorts of helpful tips there. There's this great video. So if, if you, know, you thought my talk was not your bag, there's a nice 14 minute video. It's from a, a, a group in Australia that actually summarizes my old talk in terms of the, the aging, the health conditions and the social isolation. Uh, there's something called actionable nuggets. So if you're trying to work with your family doctor who may not understand your spinal cord injury as well. These are materials that have been developed to help primary care physicians actually understand your SCI. So it's something that you may wanna to flag to your healthcare provider. And then there's tons of resources around physical activity guidelines that you can do at home, uh, again, to make all of these things accessible. Uh, I'll share this after um, so that people can access it. Again, just wanna acknowledge my you know, co-investigators, co-authors, uh, the people who did the aging work are all from BC, so you might know some of these names. And then the funding uh, for this work was from uh, the Rick Hansen Institute, which is now Praxis, uh, Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation, and the Craig Nielsen Foundation. And in terms of research, uh, a lot of my SCI stuff I do uh, with a colleague, Sarah Gilcher, through her lab. Um, and, you know, we're doing studies trying to develop better tools. Uh, for people with mobility limitations. So if there's ever any interest, uh, that's the website and you can learn more about the research from there. So thank you very much and uh, happy to take as many questions as anyone has. Um, there was just a question in the chat earlier before we get to Jolaine's question there um, from Diane and you kind of did uh, touch on this at the end, but just wanted uh, you to give you the opportunity to answer a little bit thoroughly if you like. So uh, what can we do to proactively reduce the aging process? And is there any research to support physical activity reducing the aging process? Yeah, I mean, I, there's a whole billion dollar industry on, on how to reduce the aging process. So if, if we can find the answer, I think we'd all be very rich. But yes, exercise is a great way because it helps maintain your uh, muscle mass. Uh, it releases endorphins in the brain. So, you know, whenever you're doing any uh, heavy physical activity, you start feeling better, uh, and which is uh, probably evolutionary because if we really hated it, we'd never want to go back to the gym. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence that better cardiovascular health has uh, implications for your cognitive, for your brain health. So if you're physically fit, you're less likely to develop dementia, uh, again, heart disease, so all these things will help if you're eating uh, foods high in, I think it's, um, I'm gonna probably get it wrong, oxy, antioxidants. So like um, blueberries, other foods like that, that's really good. Um, it's been recommended uh, that people with spinal cord injury, and actually most people should be on a Mediterranean diet. That holds a lot of um, 
benefits for uh, physical health. And again, the better, the healthier, the stronger we are, the less likely the aging process. So we'll less likely have aches and pains. And again, it doesn't mean you need to be a superhuman and go to the gym and lift as heavy weights as possible. Even going out on a wheelchair for you know a brisk roll, doing light yoga, anything that you can do to move your body as much as possible, depending on your level of ability, uh, will make a difference. So there's lots of things that you can do. And again, some of the resources, and, and I saw the chat, I'm happy to share the slides. And if there's problems accessing the links, I'm happy to send those to Terry and she could forward to all for that to all of you as well. Because it's really, there's a ton of information out there and resources. And I'm always surprised that people aren't aware of it or accessing it. And, 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 you're, and you're the group that really should be knowing about these types of things. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right, go ahead, Jolene. I'm sorry about the Tinkerbell thing. I was on another Zoom call and we were talking about my goats and somebody showed okay. me. Up. Okay, so I just, just want to cover a, a couple of things. There's a very interesting um, a book about integrative cardiology and it's, it, it supports the Mediterranean diet and exercise and all these other things. But, but they found by looking at a lot of studies that all things being equal, you take a group of people and none of them are smoking and they're eating the right diet and all the things. But the thing that they found that helped the cardiovascular system the most to prevent um, aging, but most protective was meditation, meditation mm. over and above yoga. And second was Tai Chi, which mm. is something that we can all do because it, it doesn't have to be, you know, it's, it's kind of, we can all do that. And uh, we don't have to do how elaborate, but they, they weren't sure if the Tai Chi was the actual, um, intricacies or if it was the meditative quality of the Tai Chi that provided these cardiovascular benefits. And I, I'm not surprised about the, the lack of, of um, research about people with spinal cord injuries. And, one, and this is one of the things that I really push on, as Terry knows, for example, they know that the people who have cardiovascular problems and as they progress with that and develop heart failure, they get specific types of sleep apnea. And because we as a general population are more prone to cardiovascular problems, we, we are going to have a propensity for different types of sleep apnea, and yet we're not really screened for it. And the same with res respiratory fatigue. You know, it's, it's much more common than they think it is. I mean, there's a lot of us who are incomplete and we have problems with respiratory fatigue. And they also know that as we age, our lungs lose pliability. So we got a double whammy just by getting older, our lungs are less, they stretch less, they don't get as much air in. And then on top of that, we have the compromise from our spinal cord injury. So I was, it was a wonderful, listening to this today, you know, the, to help push to get more research and get this information of, of, of what they actually do know. They do know some of these things, like what I just said. So we need to get it to our population so that we can get better management. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for sharing. And it's really interesting about the, the yoga, uh, the Tai Chi and the meditation. And there, there's actually a lot of work coming up around uh, mindfulness, which is a key component of that meditation and maybe the Tai Chi, because again, we all know what gets our high, our blood pressure up is, is stress, right? And, and if we can manage that stress, then that puts less uh, uh, work on our, you know, our cardiovascular system. It, 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 you know, again, it has all these different negative effects. So it's, uh, you know, the, the thing you're saying around the meditation, uh, there is some work going on with that, but definitely it needs to be more accessible accessible and and we have to find ways to make it you know fit different people it, same thing like aging is not a uniform thing you know you take one person with a spinal cord injury they may have a different aging experience than someone else for me I, I i couldn't do mindfulness i can't sit still so you know but there are other things that we can do uh but you know thanks for sharing all that information because it is uh again there's always a valuable information but it, it, it needs to be translated uh, and shared in a way that people can use it. So uh, thanks for that. Yeah, I have a question actually, um, just related to blood pressure. 
uh, as you know, um, thanks, Viv, I'll get to you. Um, but as you know, people with spinal cord injury, uh, especially higher levels, have quite a bit lower blood pressure. So mm -hmm. when, when they talk about lower blood or higher blood pressure in SCI populations, are they take, taking that into consideration or are they comparing that against an able-bodied population? Yeah, so I, I'd have to go back and look, but you know, uh, there is a recognition that depending on your level of injury uh, and, and the completeness that you're gonna have different functioning. So I think by doing those comparisons, we at least sort of get a sense where the difference is or how much of it's changed. Uh, but you know, again, when I was, and I was, again, I did this 10 years ago, so I don't remember all the nuances, but you know, in any good paper, they're gonna talk about the limitations and give some you know context and why they found this so again as i was saying uh before everyone joined terry i, I really gave the cold notes in a very high level but if you were to go through uh, all the tables uh, and uh, this article is is free so you can access it online if, if anybody if this talk didn't put you to sleep this paper definitely will but i've detailed every single uh study and and some of the key findings and uh, uh but it, it is important to take into account the person's level of injury uh, and other circumstances. And again, I, I was just really painting some broad uh, uh, strokes in terms of, of what uh, the review found, but you're absolutely right. Uh, you need to take into account the physiological changes. Uh, and it's not just, it's because it, it's not comparing apples to apples. It is apples to oranges. And some of the oranges might be tangerines or they might be uh, another variety, so. Yeah, I'm just like, oh, I wonder if like, I'll just never get high blood pressure because I can't get my blood pressure over 100 over, you know, mm. 60, but maybe that is high blood pressure for me, right? Well, yeah, and again, uh, if you have, you know, autonomic dysreflexia, you know, uh, as I think many of you know, is a silent killer. So it's really important that you, you know, monitor your, your blood pressure and, and they're aware of autonomic dysreflexia. So if you have, uh, and again, I, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but you know, if you have uh, a bug bite even below the level of injury or, or other minor wound, that can really cause some serious cardiovascular issues. And um, I, I don't know if he's still there, but Dr. Andre Krasikov is the leader in, in uh, autonomic dysplexia. That was one of the first projects I did with Dr. K and uh, we looked at that. Uh, so anyways, that was my PSA for, for this part of the talk. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you. Um, I appreciated your talk. Thank you very much um, for the information. And I look forward to the web links and all the rest of it. Um, I want to ask or mention something about aging cycles. There's been a lot of research done on aging, aging cycles, specifically for men. Women do some funny things. Um, we have babies. How does that affect us with aging? My bones went to nothing when I had my kids. I didn't know. Um, so, so that hit really hard because I was only in my twenties. Um, but then later on, we have this other aging thing called menopause, which knocks us again. Um, so when we're looking at bones, bone health and everything else that goes with that plus lung health, um, I don't know how much research is being done on females, but looking at this room, there's, there's a few of us and, uh, it's, I'm just throwing it forward that we do a lot of, of reading on what happens to boys and of course more stuff has to happen with you know the difference between a 25 year old male and a 40 year old male and a 65 year old male and an 80 year old male but th there's some weird hormones that happen with women as well and i would love to see that stuff happen if you've got a time at some point in your career yeah it's so important and i mean that's why um if you look at the canadian institutes for health research they really push looking at sex and gender as an important variable. Again, with spinal cord injury, as many of you know, it's predominantly happens in men. So again, it's easier to get access to men. And um, if, if uh, I remember when I first started at the Winter Center, if, if I went into the into any of the units, it was, it was a lot of young men, you know, very, you know, uh, all white, I'm gonna be honest, it was very homogeneous. And then after a few years working there, we started seeing a shift because again, uh, people started wearing seatbelts, you know, so that, that campaign worked. 
and there was an older age of onset and we were starting to see more women also because of non-traumatic reasons so for uh uh you know uh, tumors and i remember one time i had to find a woman for a study and she had an asian uh, last name and then i go into the unit and there were three women with a spinal cord injury who were asian and the person i was looking for wasn't even asian she was just married to somebody who was asian and so there's a lot more diversity but you're so right you need to understand what's happening with women um and in terms of the bone health again going back to kathy craven who was my mentor a mentor she's really much a, a leader in that field and uh you should probably google some of her work because she may be looking at that and is Maureen Ash in BC? I don't, I'm not familiar with that name. Okay, those are the bone. Those are the bone health people. Uh, but it's it's an important question. And again, when I'm doing work, I really do try and get women into my studies. I do observational, I do surveys, qualitative interviews. But you're right. We need to do a better job of getting what's happening to women uh, aging with an STI. Well, and and I, I question: Does our bone health have anything to do with blood pressure? Because I don't know. That's a good question. There may be a link. Again, um, I didn't. I, I couldn't get into medical school, so I went to that. I know. Got a I know. Just, in I know. It it's, it's a big question for us. I mean, yeah. when you start look at Terry's low blood pressure, mine's off the charts. Um, but if we were to look at our lives, they're probably more similar than you think. So there's a genetic involvement. But you know, is is there something to do with spinal cord injury and our bone loss and hormones and blood pressure? Like, is there a link that we can hit with some kind of, I don't know, evening primrose oil? I mean, some crazy thing could show up in the research that we don't know about. So um, again, going back to Dr. Craven, she has done clinical trials on this. I'm not up to date on that literature. There's so not. There may be some things around that. Um, I'm happy, Terry, after, not, not tonight, uh, but uh, over the next few days, I can do a quick search. And if I can find anything around that, I'm, again, I'm happy to share. And if there is nothing, you know, Terry, you know, knock on uh, the Praxis Institute door and say, hey, this is an issue. Uh, why isn't it being done? So. Thank you. Well, there's a lot of things that are brimming, Viv, that I'll bring you specifically around women's health and SCI that um, I'm very passionate about. But uh, on probably in the new year, around February, we will have Kathy Craven on to talk about um, menopause, pre-menopause. Again, we've had a, that discussion before, and so we'll, we'll bring her on, um, this time. yeah, again. She's really good. That'll, that'll be a good She's talk. amazing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Good about one. Tom, do you have a question? Yes, uh, a couple of comments. The uh, reference to diet, is well documented in that booklet, which has been advertised, but should be included with the information on this discussion today, in my mind, because I find it very helpful and I'm sure others would as well. Um, the other point is the, the lady from Creston who talked about the um, Tai Chi and was it mindfulness? Uh, what well, meditation. Um, if there's any any studies on that or reference to that, we could certainly make use of it here in Richmond. Yeah. So the person who was doing that work uh, is is a, is a was a U.S. Uh, person. I saw it at a conference many years ago. Is Susan Charlefeu, and so uh, I think she has done some work around that Mediterranean diet. I would so, say areas of, of big gaps in any any uh, in spinal cord injury and limb loss, it's sleep and diet. Those are the two areas which are so critical for well-being, uh, for health that ha have not gotten the attention that they deserve. So uh, again, it's really around um, that person, Susan Charlotte And again, Terry, I can send you, mm -hmm. you, you may make, oh God, what did I get into? And I'll send you a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, but they, that, there's, that's where I saw some evidence around that. And sleeping, again, is something, I'm doing a little bit of work with that, with a neurologist here in Toronto, where we're looking at uh, sleep uh, disordered breathing in people with spinal cord injury. So that work will be coming out shortly, but it, it is, it's so important. We, and again, even if there's a, a little bit of nuggets, we should be finding ways to share it with the community. 
Absolutely. Yeah, and Tom, actually, we had over the weekend, uh, weight management and nutrition was a big part of that um, conversation. So I'll, I'll make sure to send you that link as well so you can uh, find out. Um, Thanks, sir. But the, uh, if it's available with a uh, sort of like a, an, an index on the SEIBC website as being available, it would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And particularly, I'm thinking of the of the uh, Tai Chi and mindfulness um, stuff. Yeah, go ahead, Jolene. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, it's it's in the book called uh, titled Integrative Cardiology. And what I can do is photo photocopy off those pages and mail it to Terry, who could then email it to you, Tom. I have this very ancient ancient computer. And Terry knows that I'm real pro study, those those research studies. And so this relates just to the last study I was on and what was just mentioned about sleep and spinal cord injuries. And this is just one of those nuggets that you just that come across when you don't expect it at all. And what we found, because I was doing pulmonary exercise testing, where I was really pushing it, and because I'm on a, a BiPAP, that's like a ventilator to help me breathe because my, my spinal cord injury affects my breathing, is that when I pushed it, really pushed it, is those nights I went from zero events pre previous before to five to 10 events a night in which I stopped breathing. Uh, this is huge. And so what, what we did, these were three pulmonary exercise tests. So we, this was true for both. There were three times where I'd really pushed at different dates. And my times that I stopped breathing at night, which shows on my BiPAP records, showed they, I went from zero events to, uh, to 10 events an hour, I would stop breathing. And so then for three months, I moderated my behavior and had an echo with the next pulmonary exercise test and had significantly less events and a wonderful echo, which reflected an improvement on my right side of my heart because of, of uh, I wasn't having these events and, and wasn't pushing it so hard. So it's one of those nuggets that you don't expect to find in the research program. And, and yet it came out with these the six months with these, these pulmonary exercise tests and, and, and a BiPAP that showed that when I really pushed it, I was stopping breathing that often at night. That's good. Thank you for that marvelous info. And if we could have reference to some of these key points, not emailed necessarily just to me, obviously, but I've had the benefit of being here, but on the website in BC, SCRBC. Uh, yeah, I'm supposed to write this up for some doctors. Once I get all the data together and what I should do is send it to Terry and Terry should send it to you because mm -hmm. someone should really look at exactly what you're studying and what has to do with quality of sleep and spinal cord injuries. And, and this, this one got linked to exercise, marked exercise, because I can give you the pulmonary exercise tests. You know, I can, I can actually have the hard data on all of this, which is really nice. I'll make sure you get it. Well, amazing. We're like way past the hour. So, <laughs> Sander, I know you're- I did see a question from Rogers, oh. uh, from Roger, and I don't want to ignore anybody. Okay, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll do that last question. I know uh, uh, it's getting late for some of you and it's late for me, but I, I don't want to. So that's a really important question, Roger. The biggest problem with doing, you know, race or ethnicity related research in Canada was that for the longest time, we were told not to look at race or ethnicity. And the reason being is because people uh, in the past have misused that to uh, advance terrible policies. That's why we have a lot of research ethics in place now, uh, because people would, uh, would uh, you know, there's some famous studies where uh, for African-American men in the States, they gave them syphilis and didn't tell them and saw what happened in the long term. And there's all sorts of horrific uh, things that were done in the name of research to a variety of groups. 
And so for a long time, even when I was in graduate school, I said, should we collect data on race? They said, no, 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 we don't do that in Canada. But we now know that by excluding race or ethnicity, we're, we might be missing the picture because we might be not getting the full understanding of what's happening with somebody who is, let's say, uh, African-American or, or Latin or other uh, ethnicity uh, is happening with their health experience. So the States has more research on that. I can't quote it, but in Canada, we're trying to do a better job of integrating uh, race into our research questions and accounting for it, but to do it in a way uh, that it won't be, again, uh, abused in the past. So I, I think uh, there's a need for more research to understand what's happening, uh, again, uh, around that topic. Um, and again, it's something that I've started to work into to my research. So I don't have a good answer for you, but, it, but that's one of the reasons why there is a lack of data on that topic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, that, and now I'll shut up. I, 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 talk. <laughs> I don't know if, you, uh, if you're all interested in this, but I was at a diversity and um, equity uh, conversation and I'll share my screen just on that topic. Can you see this? It's like the dimensions of diversity, but, and I can't, uh, I can zoom in a little bit. Oops. But like where there's, you know, in the power margin is in the middle circle there. I wish I could move this over. And then as soon as you add in all of these different aspects of diversity, the more marginalized you are. Anyway, so that was a good like example of where uh, I can, if you're interested in it, I can send it out as well, but it's pretty cool. Yeah. Anyways, thanks <laughs> for uh, letting me show that. Thanks everybody for attending. No more questions. I'll send everybody uh, the links and everything, um, slides. Give me a little bit of time just to collect all the information uh, together because I'll give Sandra a few days to come up with any information uh, if he has, finds any research papers or publications that are associated to what you're all talking about um, in answer to your questions. But, uh, but hopefully by early next week, I'll be able to send it all out to you as a package so you don't get 500 emails from me. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, thank you, Sander. I really well, appreciate it. Thank thanks awesome. thanks to all of you. It was a real pleasure thank to, you, again, talk about my research. Uh, nobody at my house wants to hear me speak, so I, I, you know, any opportunity to come and, and share. And again, uh, thanks so much, uh, Terry, uh, to Spinal Cord Injury BC for, for inviting me. It's great to, to talk across the country and uh, happy to, to share anytime. So thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry.